this uh, lecture series together with University of Tübingen, the Center of Intercultural and Interdisciplinary Studies at Tübingen University. Um, for those of you who do not know the Society for Intercultural Philosophy, uh, go and uh, look up our website at, um, uh, at uh, the web uh, www.int-gip.de. Uh, you'll find website of uh, our society and you're very much invited to become a member. All right, um, for tonight's lecture, I uh, uh, welcome very warmly uh, Jonathan Chimakuna Mukeke um, and let me introduce him very briefly. Uh, Jonathan is a senior lecturer at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Uh, he has uh, been teaching uh, as a research, research associate at the University of Johannesburg and before that at uh, the University of Calabar in Nigeria for several years. His teaching and research interests cover areas of African philosophy, intercultural philosophy, logic, environmental ethics, and postmodern, postcolonial, and decolonial thought. Um, he has developed the, a concept uh, which he calls the conversational philosophy, uh, which he will introduce um, uh, tonight uh, in his lecture, uh, which uh, is entitled Overcoming the Three Challenges of Intercultural Philosophy, a Conversational Approach. Jonathan is um, uh, uh, um, currently a senior um, research fellow uh, of intercultural studies at the University of Tübingen at the Center for Intercultural and Interdisciplinary Studies, uh, which I'm heading. And I'm very glad uh, that Jonathan, that you accepted the invitation uh, to present your work to us tonight. So welcome everyone, it's your floor. Jonathan. All right, thank you very much, Niels, um, for those kind words. I also want to thank you and the Society for Intercultural Philosophy for inviting me to give this talk. I also want to thank those who have uh, spared their data and their time to join us from different places. Thank you very much, I appreciate you all. Okay, so I'll be talking on the topic overcoming the three challenges of intercultural philosophy. A conversational approach, I'll be uh, proposing an approach from the perspective of conversational thinking. Okay, so before I get to that proposal, let me quickly uh, give us a brief highlight for those who are not uh, so familiar with the literature uh, in intercultural philosophy. Okay, so some of the conceptions, some of the popular ones, begin with Heinz Kimmele, who of course um, proposes the method of philosophical dialogue um, which consists essentially uh, in an engagement between traditions on the basis of equality, mutuality, respect, recognition of difference, and so on and so forth. And then Franz Wimmer, who again, who proposes the method of philosophical polylogue, all right, a kind of a dialogue of all philosophical traditions where there is a reciprocal influence. And this is very important in his conception. So essentially he is not talking about um, a kind of a philosophical party by all philosophical traditions, not exactly. He is emphasizing, um, it could be a dialogue between two philosophical traditions. It could be um, an encounter between one philosophical tradition and other philosophical tradition. But the important thing is that there is reciprocity there and that the engagement you know, is something that is spread across board. So if, for example, A is a philosophical tradition, 
uh, in attempting to engage, to, to experience a philosophical encounter with another philosophical tradition, it has to make it a point of duty to reach all of philosophical traditions. All right. And the encounter has to be on the basis of equality uh, such that reciprocity from every other philosophical tradition uh, becomes possible. And you can see the schema that he produces to explain what exactly he has in mind. All right. There are other schemas that um, he also produced to demonstrate or to show other forms of intercultural encounter that would not meet the requirements uh, he has set forth for intercultural philosophy. All right, so going forward, there is also um, the philosopher Ramad Amol who proposes his idea of analogic hermeneutic, all right? Uh, in uh, doing intercultural philosophy, he brings in the idea of hermeneutics. We've got the duty to do a lot of uh, interpretations, re-readings, critical perspectives into what we are doing. But above all else, that has to proceed through the attitude of equality, at mutual understanding of concepts, methods, conceptions, and systems in different philosophical traditions, all right? And then here again comes Innocent Asuzo, um, whose uh, uh, um, proposal of complementary reflection can as well be um, deployed as a tool uh, for doing intercultural philosophy, all right? The emphasis from the complementary perspective is on mutual interdependence. You know, based on the realization that each philosophical tradition serves a missing link, you know, to others. In other words, that no philosophical tradition is uh, self-sufficient, all right? And the realization that um, my limitation as a philosophical tradition uh, is not something to cry about, but something to be cheerful about in the sense that there is or there are other philosophical traditions that can really complement me at the point, points of my weakness. And I do the same to others from my, the point, my point of strength, okay? So these are some of the brilliant ideas that have been floated and there are quite uh, many others, but uh, let us proceed. Just want to give us a highlight of what some folks are saying in the field of intercultural philosophy. My principal objective in this essay, this talk really, is to um, articulate and explain to us um, three challenges I have really uh, discovered um, in the burgeoning field of intercultural philosophy and to give us a proposal on how to perhaps um, uh, address that or you know, get the discussion going uh, uh, on those counts. Okay, but before I get to that, um, intercultural philosophy belongs to a family of philosophical um, theories that um, one could describe as cross-cultural philosophies, all right? Those philosophies that attempt to cross borders, uh, including not just intercultural philosophy, comparative philosophy, it, it's an idea of multicultural philosophy that is still quite um, in its infancy. All of them really belong to the category of cross-cultural philosophy in the sense that it be to cross philosophical traditions, philosophical borders, all right? And I think there are two problems. Um, I think runs across these cross-cultural philosoph philosophies. Uh, unlike the three challenges, I am going to propose some form of ongoing conversation and discussion today. I really do not have any proposal for these two problems. Rather, I'd like to leave it open and invite workers on intercultural philosophy to consider these problems and um, see what they can bring in and contribute to the discourse, all right? The first one is the problem of precedence. All right, you don't see much of this in liter the literature on intercultural philosophy, but you see a lot of it uh, on, uh, uh, in the literature on comparative philosophy, where a number of actors have been debating and discussing, and in their various essays and treatises, are trying to suggest ideas that when you consider them closely, 
you discover they are trying to say that comparative philosophy either precedes intercultural philosophy or that intercultural philosophy uh, precedes comparative philosophy. The precedence here is not really about historical emergence and development. No, that's not what it means, but in order of importance and influence, which one is uh, influences the other or should influence the other or should provide impetus or direction to the development of the other. All right, so that is what the problem of a uh, precedence um, is fairly about. I believe that a clear picture, an understanding as to where these two different uh, branches of cross-cultural philosophy um, stand would also be very, very good and important for the development of these uh, branches of cross-cultural philosophy. And the second one is crossing of border, crossing of philosophical border, all right? Intercultural philosophy is to cross border. Comparative philosophy, multicultural, these philosophies be to cross the philosophical border, all right? Now the problem is when intercultural philosophers or comparative philosophers or multicultural philosophers, all right, um, uh, get down to their trade, do they do that with the methods they are familiar with from their own philosophical traditions? Do they cross the philosophical border into another's tradition with their own method, methods of their own philosophical traditions, or do they do that with some form of a neutral method? All right? It's, 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 it sounds quite simple, but it's really a very tricky question um, that uh, deserves deeper intellectual attention as far as the disciplines uh, of cross-cultural philosophy uh, are concerned. Okay, so again, you, you have ideas that um, some scholars have, again, marshaled in terms of these border crossing and methodology uh, from Wolves who uh, talks about uh, the Tessium compa comparisonese and the comparator uh, to Burek, to Smith and Weber and uh, Baumau and the rest of them. And even Panica talks about that topical hermeneutics, something that looks quite similar to um, 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 Ramadamol's um, a proposal earlier considered. Okay, so I call upon comp intercultural philosophers, comparative philosophers, multicultural philosophers uh, to uh, consider this question and see what they can provide, uh, which again is definitely going to bring a lot of clarity uh, in the disciplines uh, that be to cross borders. All right, so intercultural philosophy. Um, uh, there is a little difficulty um, in, in, in concerning the development of intercultural philosophy, all right? A lot of work have been produced uh, by scholars in, 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 in Europe, especially in German speaking uh, world that have not diffused to the English speaking world and vice versa. And again, some huge chunk of literature have also been produced in the African philosophical traditions that haven't really diffused to the European, uh, the German or the English even speaking traditions. The, the point of it all is because intercultural philosophy has yet to um, attract that sort of importance, recognition that it deserves in the curriculum of uh, philosophy in, in different universities. So um, the, 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 the speed and pace with which it is developing and the diffusion of the ideas that are being produced in different corners of the world, uh, it's quite slow. And it will not be out of place to say that um, uh, uh, someone working in the field in another corner of the world may be completely ignorant of what other people are doing in another corner of the world, especially when you factor in uh, the barrier, the language barrier, okay? So, but in order to really, uh, and Vima had, again, and um, Yusefi and a, a host of others have really attempted to um, delineate the nature of intercultural philosophy is a kind of a branch of philosophy or is just some, you know, some orientation or what people are trying to understand what all that um, uh, is. And as a result, some intercultural philosophers 
um, took it upon themselves to prescribe rules, rules of intercultural philosophical engagement, something they believe would shed a lot of light uh, in the nature of the discipline and how to proceed uh, in practical uh, in demonstration or engagement or practice of intercultural philosophy. All right, and, and I have listed a few of such uh, rules there. You have Innocent Asuzu, whose uh, principles of complementary reflection um, can very well serve as uh, uh, rules for intercultural engagement. You have Franz Vimas, rules of polylogues, and you have Paul Gregor's 16 basic rules of intercultural philosophy. And again, the Elma Hollenstein's a dozen rules of uh, of Tom for avoiding intercultural misunderstandings. Okay, and again, uh, Heinz Kimmel's um, uh, methodology of listening as something that should play a really very important role in every philosophical dialogue. The part of listening, according to him, is very key. Okay, so these are some of the rules. There are more, there may be more, but the ones that have come to my knowledge so far um, that uh, actors have formulated to guide and, and, and regulate, direct uh, the process of intercultural philosophical inquiry, as the case may be. Okay, but despite all these rules and the important thing that measure that they really can represent and provide in intercultural philosophical uh, engagement, uh, I have again, in addition, identified um, what I here call three challenges of intercultural philosophy, all right? And I wish to discuss it here, uh, pass it across and, 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 and open a discussion on this and let's see how far it goes. Let's see, you know, um, if by discussing some of these things we might be able to extend the frontiers of the discipline and the field, all right? And uh, the first of uh, uh, such challenges is what I call the discrepancy of logical principles, all right? And I see this as a foundational challenge, foundational in the sense that logic lies at the uh, foundation of thought, okay? I uh, will discuss this um, uh, uh, more digestively when I um, engage uh, another idea called the three dimensions of thinking in this uh, cross-cultural um, philosophy. And the second challenge is um, uh, incompatibility of methods, all right? And I see this challenge as architectural, architectural in the sense of um, something that pertains to the structure, the methodological um, angle of thoughts, okay, itself. So if, for example, um, an intercultural philosopher has gone to work, all right? And that intercultural philosopher is probably taking the method um, that he or she is familiar with in, he, in his or in their philosophical tradition to engage with uh, those of another tradition, all right? Uh, how does such an individual um, uh, 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 conduct their inquiries, uh, criticisms, uh, judgments, and what have you, from their own perspective or from the perspective, how is, is, is she going to take into consideration the standards of measure, standards of authentication in that very tradition that uh, the certain individual has ventured into, all right? In exchange of ideas between two philosophical traditions, um, uh, uh, the incompatibility of methods coming from different uh, philosophical traditions is definitely going to rear up its head. How is this challenge going to be uh, confronted and handled in an intercultural inquiry? And number three is incommensurability of theories, okay? And, uh, and this is a doctrinal, uh, this one is doctrinal in the sense that it pertains to uh, the broad area of theories, concepts, and what have you, where, for example, uh, the concept of justice in two different philosophical traditions might entail something different, different things entirely, all right? Where the concept of being in two different uh, traditions may uh, mean 
two different things, all right? So what happens? How do we handle this? Um, again, uh, these are some of the ideas you, you may have also noticed some um, intercultural philosophers, you know, hint at one way or the other. I, 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 I feel it is important to articulate them here, three of them, and give them um, uh, 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 a sort of discussion and explanation that I am going to provide for these challenges in the course of this talk, All right? Okay, so moving forward, um, from, and this time around, from a conversational perspective, all right? How would I, if asked, you know, suggest ideas on how to overcome some of these challenges from a conversational thinking perspective? Okay, I like to get down to the clarification of concepts, elementary explanations of ideas and words, all right? Beginning with the word inter, right? Um, which normally we use to formulate adjectives, all right? Adjectives, uh, different types of adjectives, really, which includes intercultural philosophy, uh, used to qualify kind of philosophy and other things, other types of adjectives that could be formulated with the word inter. Which the dictionary tells us that uh, it means between or among the people, things or places mentioned, all right? So it gives us a preliminary idea that when inter is used to formulate the adjective intercultural, we might be talking about encounter between cultures, amongst cultures, between peoples from different cultures, uh, from between different places, amongst different philosophical traditions, as the case may be, all right? Good. Now, um, if again, we really want to uh, discover, since the word, this prefix inter could be used to derive a host of uh, uh, adjectives, if we want to, really this decipher the sense, the sense of the inter that is most appropriate for its appearance in intercultural philosophy, then one way to do it would be to do a little bit of a language analysis for that, okay? And we consider two examples, international, all right? Interreligious, okay? If we think of, if we, if we use international to qualify sports, okay, we, 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 have, we might be talking about international sporting competitions like football, cricket, team competitions, individual competitions as the case may be, all right? And notice the word there, competition, competition. Now let us move to the second adjective, interreligious. Let's, for example, use it to qualify interreligious prayer meeting, all right? should really be used to character, characterize the appearance of that, that prefix inter in intercultural philosophy. Definitely because of the, um, the idea of philosophy, we uh, would have less problem uh, accepting and agreeing that the something uh, from the conversational perspective, we could say contestations, protestations, as the case may be. So given all this, um, um, a conversationalist would then move to articulate a conception of intercultural philosophy as a metaspheric examination of the viability of the foundation, architecture, 
and doctrine of one philosophical tradition through the methodological purview of another tradition. Okay, so there are a few concepts that you probably have to take note of them. The first one, metaspheric, all right? This concept is um, um, pointing uh, towards the, 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 um, the aim of uh, metaphilosophical inquiry, met metamethodological inquiry, and metalogical inquiry. All right, and the next one that you may have to take note of there, you may want to take note of there is um, the idea that an intercultural philosopher takes their own method from their own philosophical tradition into another philosophical tradition, all right, to examine the foundations and that is the logical principles of that other philosophical tradition. The architecture, and that is the methodological uh, structure of that philosophical tradition and the doctrinal aspect of that philosophical tradition from the methodological purview of the intercultural philosopher who is conducting this inquiry. So uh, this proposal is, um, 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 uh, really uh, saying that uh, in intercultural philosophy, an intercultural philosopher has to take with them the, the methods um, of philosophy in their own philosophical tradition when they cross the border to the next philosophical tradition, to examine the next philosophical tradition. This will have some really uh, implications and consequences, which I will again explain in the course of this uh, uh, talk. Um, and um, as I proceed now, okay, so from a conversational approach perspective, um, uh, this is, this is, this, these are really not conceived yet as principles or rules of intercultural philosophy, but something that could really uh, initiate that discussion uh, from the purview of conversational thinking. All right, that um, an intercultural philosophical inquiry uh, has to be orthographic. And by orthographic, uh, I, I, I mean that the philosopher has to take with him the method they are familiar with in their own tradition into the next tradition. So as to be critical and rigorous enough, all right? Yet yeah, again, it has to be a, a, a contestation and a protestation. These signal the idea of it's got to be an engagement. It's not a one-sided affair, all right? Um, if I elect to uh, examine the philosophy of the next philosophical tradition, then they also have the same right to examine the principles, the foundational, architectural, and doctrinal elements in my own philosophical tradition is at that level um, um, the inter the interrelationship the relationship uh, is formed at, at that level so as to be argumentative right and of course competitive uh, but not cooperative so to speak all right where the idea of cooperative, really is one that um, 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 really does not uh, highlight the importance of critical engagement, uh, highlight the importance of rigor, highlight the importance of firm and adversions, uh, uh, as the case may be. And number three, it has to be conversational, conversational, so as to open a new vista for thought. All right? It is fairly okay for people to, for intercultural philosophers to conduct an inquiry, uh, aiming to fault find, uh, aiming to analyze, examine, you know, do all, all kinds of things. Uh, but emphatically, emphatically, um, an intercultural philosopher who takes their own method to the next philosophical tradition to examine it, 
um, uh, will be tempted, will be tempted to pursue a cause of self-justification to demonstrate that their own philosophical tradition is the philosophy and these other ones are really not philosophy, so to speak. Okay, the temptation will be there. It will be strong. But as I will explain in the subsequent slides, okay, um, um, having that a sort of uh, a different type of mindset aimed at seeing what could come out of this encounter in the sense of uh, following the realization of the limitations that the their different philosophical traditions have, what could come out of it? What can we do to, what can we learn from those limitations of ours? And what questions can we frame out of those limitations uh, to provide further for further inquiries and um, uh, philosophical encounters and uh, rich conversations as the case may be. And number four is uh, what I like to call the law of the law of laws, all right? Um, uh, in, the, in a preceding slide where I um, highlighted some uh, intercultural philosophers that have um, uh, provided us with um, rules of engagement in intercultural philosophy. You can see it was quite a long list and some of the rules numbered up to 16 and above, all right? I look at those rules, I study those rules, and I think there is an idea that is, yeah, it's not strictly and clearly formulated in those rules. If hinted at here and there, but not clearly formulated. All right? And, and that is what I conceptualize here, formulated as the law of the laws. What do I mean by the law of the laws? The rules of converse intercultural philosophy are quite many now has been formulated by people, and they are bound to continue to grow. All right, uh, but can we have a law? Can we have a rule that should guide the rule formulation in intercultural philosophy? All right, can we have a rule, a law that can guide and regulate the formulation of rules of engagement in intercultural philosophy? And that is the law of the laws, the law that regulates the other laws that are formulated and simply stated as follows. No principle of intercultural philosophy should be draconian. And the idea of draconian has both negative and positive uh, interpretations, directions, all right? Um, the positive um, aspect would be to, uh, 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 to prevent, all right, a formulation of rules of intercultural philosophy that uh, really lower down the standard so much with intention of accommodating as many people, as many cultures, as many ideas as possible, only to run the risk of accommodating ideas that, uh, you know, strictly speaking, might really not look uh, qualify as philosophical, all right, in our understanding of philosophy. Okay, that would be the positive formulation of that law of the laws. The negative formulation of it would be uh, not to formulate rules that uh, really heighten the standard of intercultural philosophy, the bar, you know, tighten it so, uh, make it so tight, you know, so as to um, really exclude, all right, exclude cultures, uh, philosophies and ideas that ordinarily should really qualify, meet the normal average standard of philosophy as a discipline, okay? So that becomes uh, my formulation of the law of the laws uh, to guide the formulation of the rules of intercultural engagement, which I suspect, you know, are really going to come in uh, droves uh, in the next uh, decade or so. So, with all this set in motion uh, about what uh, uh, I really think intercultural philosophy should be about, it's a matter of opinion. Um, the discipline is still uh, developing and growing. So people have our opinions. And um, where I do not really agree with uh, some of the opinions, I have 
putting uh, putting out this as my op opinion for people again to discuss and disagree with and make suggestions if needs be. So um, uh, from those um, rules, so to speak, which I have just discussed in the previous slide, I move to talk about the ultimate question of intercultural philosophy. These are really big claims, big claims, uh, uh, and of course, you know, big claims attract big criticisms and all that. But that is, I believe, one way to advance the discipline of intercultural philosophy. You know, ultimate question of intercultural philosophy. And I formulate it this way. How should we philosophize in order to philosophize accurately? As the ultimate question of intercultural philosophy. How should we philosophize? in order to philosophize accurately, okay? And then I am saying here that this question is not as simple as it looks, and I'll begin to un untie it presently. This question sets out with two assumptions, two assumptions. The number one is that there are specific ways to philosophize in order to philosophize accurately. That's an assumption, but our question, number two is that those specific ways, okay? Those specific ways are uh, the ways of our own tradition. So any intercultural philosopher, if that intercultural philosopher is from the Western tradition or from the African tradition or the Asian tradition broadly conceived, uh, Chinese, Japanese, Indian, South American traditions, uh, Polynesian tradition, Every intercultural philosopher that asks themselves this question immediately commits to these two really dangerous assumptions, all right? As dangerous as these assumptions are, they are assumptions that must be made before uh, setting out uh, uh, on the campaign of intercultural inquiry. If, of course, one is doing so from the conception of conversational approach that I, I, I have provided before now, which of course insists that intercultural philosophical inquiry should be done with the method an individual is familiar with in their own tradition, going into the next tradition to examine the foundations, architecture and doctrine of that tradition. Okay, which again gives you an idea of unfairness. How is that individual ever going to arrive at something that is balanced, objective, all right? Why, how can you uh, uh, demonstrate that such an individual or such an approach will not seek to residualize one philosophical tradition and uh, uh, promote another philosophical tradition where that inquirer comes from, all right? That is a possibility, but stick with me, stick with me. These two dangerous assumptions, uh, 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 assumptions that are immediately made by anyone who agrees with me that how should we philosophize in order to philosophize accurately is the ultimate question of intercultural philosophy. So when we, for you to realize the danger in, uh, in that question and the two assumptions made there, when we, for example, take that question and the mindset of those two assumptions across the border in a bid to conduct an intercultural philosophical inquiry, we attempt to examine the doctrine, the architecture and foundation of another tradition through the lens of our own tradition. All right, but those people also who belong to that tradition would in turn have, of course, the space to do the same to our own tradition. Someone would say that this will set off some form of rancor, some form of counter residualizations, uh, uh, um, as we see racism even creates um, problems of that nature uh, everywhere in the world, even in the intellectual space. All right, and this appears to uh, smoothen the path to that sort of um, uh, uh, phenomenon. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, uh, that intercultural philosopher would have to ensure 
that their inquiry you know, meets the standard of credibility, all right? Passes the test of credibility, all right? And in determining the credibility of an intercultural philosophical encounter, how does the conversational approach um, um, explain that, all right? Now, it's simple. A simple explanation is that an intercultural philosophical encounter is credible, right? If the inquirer seeks, seeks to falsify those two assumptions, all right? And uh, an intercultural philosophical en encounter would lack credibility, would be incredible if such an inquirer who is working with a method in his own tradition, who has uh, accepted the ultimate question of intercultural philosophy, and who has committed themselves to the two as dangerous assumptions, seeks to justify those two assumptions. Then such an intercultural philosophical inquiry, encounter with credibility, because there's something that happens uh, the Platonian philosophical tradition from the ancient Greece that set off the uh, the, the, the practice of philosophy as one uh, that um, uh, uh, revels in processes of justifications, all right? Following the uh, deductive logic uh, uh, put together by Aristotle uh, was met in uh, the 20th century by Karl Popper's idea of falsificationism, which is a different direction to pursuing the philosophical agenda, except that there is an underlying, very thin membrane, yet very rich perspective that really shows you some uh, important difference in the two approaches. When um, that can happen, especially in the mind, in the mind, and may influence uh, the direction of inquiry or intercultural philosophical encounter. One who seeks to justify those two dangerous assumptions, uh, it would most likely be tempted to do so at all costs, all right? Not only do so at all costs, that is even not where the greater danger lies. Where the greater danger lies is that the individual might be blinded, might be blinded to the vision uh, uh, um, uh, the, the vision of intercultural, uh, that a true intercultural philosopher should have. Uh, and I will come down to explaining that shortly, all right? That intercultural philosophy from the conversational point of view uh, should not be about winning arguments, ultimately. It should not be about tolerating nonsense, no, okay? It should not be about these two. It should be, and this constitutes what I, again, captured there as the goal of intercultural philosophy, what the goal of intercultural philosophy should be, okay? It should be to open a collective vista, a path to new ideas informed by a realization of mutual limitations in order to extend the frontiers of knowledge. I'll explain this. The intercultural philosopher who seeks to justify those two dangerous assumptions. Remember those two assumptions? One, that um, um, there are specific ways of doing uh, philosophy, all right? Number two, and those specific ways of doing philosophy are the ways endorsed in my own philosophical tradition. Those are the two dangerous assumptions. Now, the intercultural philosopher who seeks to justify those assumptions in the course of using Owen's method to examine um, the foundation, the architecture and the doctrine of another philosophical tradition would be blinded to the fact of good things that could come out of such an encounter, all right? I might begin to seek to win arguments or might begin to seek to tolerate all kinds of nonsenses, okay? Uh, if you recall the law of the laws, you know, tries to put positively and negatively prohibit um, the rules of intercultural philosophical engagements being draconian, 
All right. So the goal of intercultural philosophy, which I believe uh, can be realized and reached when uh, an intercultural philosopher seeks to falsify those two dangerous assumptions, such an individual, when in an encounter with a strange philosophical tradition, carries with them the kind of open mind, open mind that uh, is interested in learning new things, in learning not only um, where their own philosophical tradition commands advantage over the other one, but in learning where the other philosophical tradition it is examining appears to command some advantage over their own. All right, and seeing these limitations not as something that really discounts one philosophical tradition or the other, but something that opens a new vista for inquiry, a vista that can only be opened at such level of intercultural engagement that will lead to formulation of questions um, that can only be formulated at, at such level. So that in pursuit of such questions, the uh, frontiers of knowledge from the intercultural dimension could be extended. Okay, so uh, in order to, um, as I be to uh, round off from now uh, in the next couple of slides, in order to um, uh, really explain the three challenges broadly, uh, I have come up with the idea of 3D thinking, three dimensions of thinking uh, in a system in intercultural philosophy, cross-cultural philosophy, comparative philosophy, and where and what have you, all right? And in a simple sense, I've tried to conceive a system of a system, okay, as 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 as, as, as an organized entity, an organized uh, body of idea with some set of rules guiding and governing its operations, all right? In every such systems broadly constru construed, there are three broad parts that can easily be identified, at the bottom of which is logic, okay? What does logic do in a system? It provides foundation, and these foundations are uh, articulated in laws and principles that govern and guide thoughts, all right? And on top of logic, we have methods sitting because it is on top of logic that methods are articulated and methods are various ways of applying the laws of logic, all right? And then theories, the ideas, these are uh, uh, um, organized, the way of organizing ideas in line with a specific method, this method or that method um, as the case may be. So these are really the three basic components that you see in any system. And if you want to, as I explained from a conversational perspective, that an intercultural philosopher should be interested in metaspheric inquiries, by which I mean math, meta philosophy, not just philosophy, but meta philosophy, all right? Uh, meta methodology and meta logic. All right. Now, uh, 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 in, 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 in further breaking this down in the figure two, you see there, uh, you see the um, my diagram. Uh, at the bottom is the foundation, that is the logic. All right. An intercultural philosopher coming from a, a, a philosophical tradition, let's call it A, to examine. Um, uh, to, uh, to, to engage with another philosophical tradition, call it B, all right, is operating from a metaspheric perspective, has to examine the principles of logic of that tradition, okay? To know how solid it is to warrant and justify, uh, as the case may be, all ideas that are built on that in that tradition. That philosopher is also interested in meta methodological inquiries, you know, examining the methods of that other tradition to see whether they are really viable enough. They are also interested in meta philosophical uh, questions, all right, to uh, uh, um, engage and examine uh, the, their concepts, 
all right? Their theories, the assumptions of that philosophical tradition, okay? So for me, and by my conception uh, following the conversational approach of intercultural philosophy, the intercultural philosopher is not really going there to going to another philo philosophical tradition to um, uh, seek to do the normal thing they do about uh, the ideas and concepts and use a certain method all that. He is going there specifically to question the foundation, the logical foundation of that tradition, the methodological structure of that tradition and the doctrines of that tradition. And these are meta, uh, meta discursive uh, activities. Okay, so <clears throat> taking them one after another is a way of demonstrating some examples and I'll try to hurry over some of these things. Um, beginning with foundation logic, and someone comes from African philosophy and wants to um, uh, engage with Western philosophy, all right? That individual, for example, is coming with an idea with um, a, a, study, a given method in African philosophy, all right? And using it to question and examine um, uh, the foundations of Western philosophy. He's going to tackle the logical basis of that of Western philosophy and vice versa, all right? And in doing that, the first challenge, remember the first challenge we highlighted as part of the three challenges of intercultural philosophy will come upon the discrepancy of logical principles, all right? And I give you an example. At the bottom, you see the laws of classical uh, logic, all right? Excluded middle contradiction identity. Above it, you see, again, laws, supplementary laws of thought, all right, um, that um, uh, direct is logic, which is a logic formulated from the African um, uh, uh, thought system. Now, if you begin to analyze these laws, you see that the, there are discrepancies and the same thing goes with their principles and the life. At the right, you see the principles um, in the Western philosophical tradition. Uh, are the, by your right, you see uh, some of the principles from the African philosophical traditions. And these principles, again, um, uh, do not uh, strictly um, agree, okay? The difference, however, is that... Hello? Did somebody say something? Okay. So these are the... This is, but what do we recommend from the conversational perspective, bearing in mind uh, have, the, the, what the intercultural inquirer does to those two dangerous assumptions. He seeks to falsify them rather than seeking to justify them, all right? So bearing in mind that the discrepancy would not mean that one is consistent and that the other logical structure is inconsistent, no, all right? It would mean that their expressive powers, I mean, in terms of the scope and precision are different. If you say, for example, that two-valued logic gains in precision, all right, you would again admit that it loses quite a lot in terms of scope. If you say, for example, that it zooms the logic gains a lot in terms of scope, you would also agree that it loses quite a lot in terms of precision, all right? And that um, <clears throat> uh, gives the intercultural philosophers the idea that, look, we can think about this as you know, exciting problems and issues we should seek to resolve. We should seek, inquire, and, and try to deepen human knowledge instead of seeing it as a sort of winner takes it all, seeing it as an avenue to repudiate or to rescue your lives, uh, the other logic, the logic of that tradition or the logic of the other tradition. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, of course, I try to explain the. Um, the three laws from the Zumezu paradigm here, but let's just move on. Um, in terms of architecture, where you have the second challenge, incompatibility of methods, it's again the same thing. You take with, your, with you the method in your tradition to examine and question the viability of the method in the other tradition. There's got to be incompatibility of methods, all right? That will come up almost immediately. And then you'd be tempted um, the, the, the intercultural philosopher that seeks to justify those assumptions will be tempted to capitalize on that, to discount and condemn and residualize 
a philosophical tradition that it is examining its method, all right? But the one who seeks to falsify those assumptions would not do go that way, okay? Such a, such a person would not see the incompatibility of method um, uh, as meaning that one is viable and one is not viable, but that uh, it, uh, it, will, it will mean that the capacities of those methods are different, okay? Uh, in that, for example, a Western developed method might seek primarily to dispel contradictions. An African developed methods might seek primarily to accommodate complementations, all right? And, 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 and that's a new way and a different way of looking at, at, at some of these challenges that we notice in intercultural philosophy. And number three, um, as I bid to round off, number three is doctrine, incommensurability of theories, all right? Intercultural philosopher engages um, in metaphilosophical inquiries about uh, the veracity of claims, theories, uh, viability of concepts uh, in, in other philosophical traditions. And, 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 and they're bound to be uh, incommensurability of concepts and theories arising as a result of using the method of one tradition to examine another tradition, okay? Um, but it would not mean that one is veracious and the other is not. It would mean uh, that their contexts of enunciations are different, all right? Uh, the idea I, uh, again, have examined somewhere in, in the form of uh, context obsessed facts. Um, as a subject of another day. Okay, so uh, in summary, summarizing intercultural philosophy without tears. Should we do intercultural philosophy without tears? All right, and what do I mean? It's, it's um, um, I am only talking about intercultural philosophy that remember the law of the laws, okay? The positive formulation of it and it encourages us to uh, accommodate as much as possible, but to be careful not to accommodate ideas and principles that you know we'll look at and say, no, you know, these things are really not philosophical as such. Okay. Uh-huh. So should philosophy in whatever structure shed tears? Okay, and I mean those emotions of care, of solidarity, of recognition, of tolerance, and all that. No, 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 let's just allow them. It's all about, the cultural philosophy is all about tolerating. Let a thousand flowers bloom. Everyone should just bring whatever they have and say philosophy. It's okay by us. Put, put it down on the table. Put it down on the table. That's okay. All right? It's a challenge that the cultural philosophers would have to encounter and confront you know, to save their discipline. Otherwise, it, it wouldn't be difficult anymore, uh, in no distant time from now, to distinguish intercultural philosophy. It would be difficult to distinguish intercultural philosophy from a sort of intercultural engagements that, again, occur in different other disciplines. All right, so the um, criteria of rigor, criticality, uh, of argumentations, you know, and proof all those criteria, they've got to be maintained as we make our rules of intercultural philosophy. And that is what this diagram here uh, from the conversational perspective gives you. We call it the conversational curve that demonstrates the process of an intercultural engagement and inquiry that preserves the tincture of philosophy while at the same time allowing uh, adequate playground for our, our flowers to bloom. Okay, so um, I'm not going to uh, delve into explanation of that diagram for want of time, but permit me to highlight uh, my fight la fight last slide that intercultural philosophy can be conceived as a type of relationship, all right? But a specific type of relationship, the relationship of creative struggle, all right? And what is the relationship of creative struggle all about? Let me first distinguish it from, from other forms of relationships that have been identified um, in the literature, specifically in African philosophy, the relationship of identity, all right? The 
the, 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 a form of identifying uh, with a cause, all right? Identifying with a, a given cause, relationship of solidarity, all right? Um, caring and showing care, mutuality, engaging with others in solidarity in pursuit of a given cause, all right? Relationship of, a dif of difference, you know, pursuing your own cause. When an individual pursues their own cause, it looks as if they're on their own. They are really not on their own. The idea that one can go their own way is a form of relationship to others that that individual is moving away from. It's a relationship of difference, all right? And then at the abstract level, there's relationship of notional solidarity. We are notions from different backgrounds, cultural backgrounds and what have you, could really share a lot you know, in common and virtually seem to endorse one another or endorse the assumptions of um, one another. And then finally, the relationship of creative struggle, all right? Um, um, uh, it's a relationship where two epistemic agents, for example, and now we extend that to the cultural level, two cultures of philosophy, two intercultural philosophers, and the two philosophical traditions could engage in the idea is to really question vigorously and rigorously the basic assumptions of uh, each tradition's uh, uh, philosophical traditions, beginning from foundation to architecture to doctrine, as we already have highlighted, okay? But it is also aimed at creating, it is aimed at moving forward. It's aimed at opening a new vista for thought, a new vista for thought that could direct and inform new sets of questions that can only be raised at such an intercultural engagement, all right? So it is a complementarity, but one that reveals as a creative struggle. I'd like to pause here and take your questions, criticisms, comments, um, as the case may be. Thank you very much for coming and listening to me. I appreciate you all. Thank you, over to you, uh, Niels. <laughs>